Kia ora. Dzień dobry. Hello. My name is Rob Garrett. Welcome to my presentation on the VLT method for creating enchanted scenes. I'm an islander. Yes, originally I'm from the beautiful islands of Aotearoa, New Zealand, in the South Pacific, right next to Australia. And now I find myself in Poland, in the port city of Gdynia on the Baltic coast, where I am teaching the art program in a small, private, bilingual, it's English and Polish elementary school. I love working with 10 to 15 year olds because this period spans the transition from art making based on sensory experiences, social connections, and the free imagination to children's evolving visual perception and self-awareness and their growing expectations for representational rigor. Now I want to say a special thank you to Trina Colhalo and Bob Rika and the whole team at Oat K-12 for inviting me to be your keynote speaker for today's summer camp. Thank you so much. In keeping with the island theme, I've invited along Mary Blair. She was a concept illustrator in the Disney Studios in the 1950s. And this beautiful picture behind me is one of her concept images for Neverland for the movie Peter Pan. This concept was never used in the movie, but for me it's a wonderful example for today's talk because it captures all the characteristics of the VLT method for enchanted scenes. Why did I develop this lesson, the VLT method, for my students? I wanted them to become more self-aware, more self-conscious picture makers by thinking about the background first. And because this method is tuned into children's mood-based art making, it is ideal for helping them create pictures where we are drawn in to their narrative, to their story, through our feeling responses. What's coming up? First, I will explain my VLT method. Second, I'm going to demonstrate the VLT method and this is your chance to join in and make your own VLT artwork at the same time as me. Thirdly, I'm going to show a bunch of student examples and hopefully this will indicate for you the range of creative possibilities and the stylistic variety that is possible with this lesson. Fourthly, towards the end, I'm going to share some of my thoughts about teaching for artistic behaviors in a choice-based program by using my method of creating open-ended situations for students. And finally, I will share my thoughts on how to assess student achievement in these settings. My VLT lesson has three parts. First, understanding the VLT method and terminology and discussing each element in relation to the inspiration pictures. I usually devote about 10 minutes to this. Second, the students' quick sketches and brainstorming plus my two five minute demonstrations and I allow about 20 minutes altogether. And thirdly, the students make their own enchanted scene picture and I allow about 60 minutes depending on the time spent on steps one and two plus cleanup time. What is the VLT method for enchanted scenes and where did it come from? Let's take this phrase enchanted scenes to begin with. Clearly I'm talking about pictures that may be magical but more broadly than that, pictures that are expressionistic, pictures that create a mood. It may be anticipation, it may be wonder, it may be drama. I'm thinking of pictures that we might find in children's books, in movies, in art history. 
And before I talk about what V, L and T stand for, this question of where did it come from? In the classroom, I'm often looking for very practical solutions for students to complex problems. And the complex problem here is how to develop a consciousness about a whole picture. And uh, when I look at art history, when I look at movies, and when I look at children's illustrations and much photography, I see there's a pattern. And what I noticed is there's a pattern of the way artists and photographers, animators, illustrators and movie makers construct their scenes to draw us in to the emotional moment and to help us connect with the character's experience in that moment. And these pictures are often combining quite a complex context, a visual context, the scenery, as well as action. Looking at these, I noticed there was a pattern. There were always three elements that came together and that were woven together in these pictures and compositions that helped the creator, that helped the filmmaker or the artist convincingly convey the emotions and feelings that were being experienced by the character. So what are these three elements? I'm going to show you some examples of these. So first of all, V stands for vignette, the darkening of the space around the middle of the picture. It may be the crowding of that space with shapes, or it may be the crowding of that space with darker tones or hues. Vignette. L stands for luminosity. That is, there is a bright core of light or energy in the center of the picture, very often in the background. Many of these pictures use backlighting and silhouetted shapes to create this emphasis around a light source. Sometimes we don't see the light source, at other times there is a shaft of light coming through a forest, or there is a sunset or a sunrise. But this luminosity is a driver of the emotional core of the picture. And the third letter is T. T stands for tall and for tiny. So T is about the scale of the picture. And very often what we have in the vignette forms of the picture is very, very tall, overshadowing forms or shapes. The context is massive compared with the relatively tiny figures, the main characters in that moment in the story. So vignette, luminosity, and this tall and tiny, the scale, these are the three elements of the VLT method for enchanted scenes. Now let's have a look at some examples and you will immediately recognize those elements. V stands for vignette, the darkening of the space around the middle of the picture. It may be the crowding of that space with shapes, or it may be the crowding of that space with darker tones or hues. Vignette. L stands for luminosity. That is, there is a bright core of light or energy in the center of the picture, very often in the background. Many of these pictures use backlighting and silhouetted shapes to create this emphasis around a light source. Sometimes we don't see the light source, at other times there is a shaft of light coming through a forest, or there is a sunset or a sunrise. But this luminosity is a driver of the emotional core of the picture. And the third letter is T. T stands for tall, and for tiny. So T is about the scale of the picture. 
And very often what we have in the vignette forms of the picture is very, very tall, overshadowing forms or shapes. The context is massive compared with the relatively tiny figures, the main characters, in that moment in the story. So vignette, luminosity, and this tall and tiny, the scale, these are the three elements of the VLT method for enchanted scenes. What do you think? My students found this enlightening and they found it a very useful tool for their picture making. We're going to move to a demonstration now and you may want to join me and make your own picture while I'm showing you how I would demonstrate this for the students. On screen I have listed the range of art materials you might want to use in the classroom when doing this project. But for today's demo session, all you need is some copy paper, art papers if you have it would be great, and then something for quick colour drawing like colour markers or pastels. Or if you have a drawing app on your tablet, you could use that. See you in two minutes. The first part of my VLT demonstration has four simple steps. For me, the demonstration ought to be as interactive as possible. It is an opportunity for conversation and collaboration. Therefore, I like to demonstrate at a desk or table in the middle of the room and have the students gather around, sitting or standing close enough to see everything I'm doing and yet far enough back so that there is room for everyone to see. I'm working with classes of up to 18 students at a time, and I know this method works with classes up to 25 students as well. Check that students are comfortable and that they have good sight lines. Teaching colour expression begins with not drawing with a graphite pencil. Graphite pencils tend to trigger colouring in behaviours, that is, children will tend to draw outlines and lots of details before filling them in with colour. Because enchanted scenes are about mood and colour expression, we need the children to be working with direct colour from the start. Therefore, I like to encourage students to start sketching with a mid-blue, a colour that will 
easily recede into the distance under successive layers of colour. Step 1. Teaching composition in this lesson starts with the picture frame. My instruction to the students is make at least three different shaped picture frames. Rather than passively accept the shape of your paper, think about the shapes your picture could be. This is a visual brainstorming activity, so we want to come up with lots of ideas without worrying about which one we like best. We will choose later. Here's how I do it with the students standing around my demo table. I ask the students, what other shapes could I draw? Accepting all suggestions with a yes and then drawing them models good brainstorming behavior and affirms the student's ideas. I love it when a student suggests an odd shape. I take the same approach. Yes, great idea. Even simple shapes can be tricky and students need to see that anything might be possible. Maybe a student suggests a triangle. So I draw one but standing on its tip and I point out it might be easier this way because you can put your tiny characters down here in the point and then create a towering vignette in the top two corners. Sometimes a group has just been studying geometry in the math class and there's a flood of new geometric shapes being suggested. I embrace all of these and in doing so, I know I am affirming student choice as well as encouraging the notion that art can get its ideas from math too. Students will also wonder if they can introduce their personal passions, pets, objects, game characters, anime characters, and yes, even object outlines and character outlines can make great frames. What about an ice cream? Yes. What about Totoro? Yes, even Miyazaki's Totoro character would be a good picture frame. I find that these interactions are easier and more personal when everyone is grouped around a single demo table. Plus you will notice that the demo is not one-sided. What the students see being drawn in front of them is coming from both the teacher and the students. They are already working on the project participating in the project, rather than simply, rather passively, watching a demo. This participation continues with step two. Color expression in the VLT depends on the two main colors of the composition, the main color of the vignette forms and the main color of the light source, the luminous background or center. I remind students that we want to compose scenes that engage us emotionally that invite us in by creating an enchanted mood, a feeling of intrigue, a sense of mystery, or a feeling of wonder. Therefore, how they feel about the expressive nature of color is important. In this step, we want each student to quickly sketch a few color combinations that might work for them. During the demo, I ask for their suggestions right from the start. It might be dark green and bright yellow pink, and a mix of dark blue, purple, and black. Or a monochrome combo, like a black vignette and white luminosity. Step three. Now combine the frames with the color pairs by making a range of very quick sketches of different vignette shapes and illuminated centers. Make these sketches in less than 10 seconds each. Yes, 10 seconds. Again, we're still brainstorming. We are still making very quick actions that say, I wonder what this might look like. Having shown the students these three steps, I send them back to their desks to create those sketches. Did you do these three steps with me? If not, do them now using direct color. Step one, create a minimum of three different frames. Step two, create a few color combos. And step three, combine your frames and your color schemes in a few 10 second composition sketches. 
While the students are still at their desks, I ask them to look at all their sketches, all their brainstorming, and choose one frame, one color combo, and one vignette shape that they like the best. Maybe they need to mix and match from several sketches to get the composition they like, and then do that then. Make a quick version of that combo. You have now chosen a possible starting point. Students can change their minds later, but I like them to make even a provisional decision about their own preferences before they see the next part of the demonstration, because it keeps them in the game as active participants rather than passive bystanders. I ask the students to come back to the demo table again and stand as before so that they can see what I'm doing while I explain the next steps. We are going to start with the vignette elements. Remember that we have two ways of creating a vignette and that these two ways are often combined. First, a vignette is a shaded circular edge to the picture that makes the center of the picture seem relatively brighter. The second type of vignette is created when shapes at the edge of the foreground of the picture curve inwards, forming an arch or a tunnel which further directs our attention towards the middle of the picture. We will use both of these methods in the demonstration. We must also be careful to leave space for our luminous background or light source. And this will be somewhere in the middle of the picture. Remember that the middle of the picture will be radiant with light and this light is often a pale sky or a backlight or a shaft of light mysteriously falling into the middle and far distance. This luminosity often creates silhouettes of everything in front of it creating also a magical glow. All the fine details and the characters can be added later by leaving space for them or by planning to introduce them later as an overlay. First of all, we need to block in the vignette areas and leave space for the luminosity. I want to avoid the unthinking or passive use of the white paper as a color in the composition. Using brown paper demands that children make more conscious choices about the distribution of their light and dark tones and their pale and saturated hues. In addition, this brown paper has more tooth, more texture than most white drawing papers, so it makes it easier for children to layer drawing media. The technique that I recommend and which I am demonstrating here is to stand at their workstation and to start sketching the composition in color with broad gestural strokes using a mid blue marker pen or a brush pen. I love using brush pens. I want them to draw gesturally with this under color so they allow their feelings and their gestures to create the main areas, shapes, and flow lines in their composition. I suggest that they start this without overthinking it and therefore that they discover what emerges. Once shapes and proportions begin to emerge that they like, I encourage them to reinforce these with darker gestural strokes and then they can start building up more and more layers of color. You'll notice that I have started with the vignette structures the tall and overarching forms that will dominate the edges, the front foreground, and the top of the composition. And you can see that I'm not creating any of the light source, the luminous colors, yet. I'm leaving space for these, but I think it is important to get the vignette elements blocked in first because these create the overall structure for the whole composition. There is another reason. Making students work on the edges of the composition like this counteracts the way many children will often work quite unconsciously, but habitually, by starting with the middle of the paper. And then the background becomes a later problem to solve. And one of the primary benefits of the VLT method is that it gives students practical skills in how to build a composition. One, from the edges at the start towards the middle later. Two, from large areas of color and tone at the start towards details later. And three, with attention to the whole composition, not just the action details. 
Once I get to this stage of the drawing, incomplete, I send the students back to their desks to get started. I encourage them, if they wish, to make some more small quick sketches using direct colour, but on a smaller piece of brown paper before they start on the larger sheet. Why did I make my demo drawing so quickly and why didn't I show them a completed teacher example? These are two very important questions connected with my desire to encourage student creativity through choice balanced with skills development by following a method. Firstly, I work quickly, too quickly in fact, because, and I explained this to the students at the time, I want to use up as little time as possible on the demo so that they have as much time as possible for creating. Secondly, I leave the work unfinished, and I explain this to the students too, because I am only drawing to show them how to use the VLT method. I am not showing them what they must draw. Therefore, they are not going to copy my drawing. So where must their drawing idea come from? I ask them to create their own mashup of any inspiration they gained from looking at the examples, plus the techniques of the VLT method, plus their own free imagination. They may create any subject they wish using the VLT method. And the advice I give about how to get started is to think about the mood they want to create, the feeling they want to infuse into the art, and the style they feel like using. Now I also want to show you the white paper alternative demonstration and probably at this stage if you haven't started already you might like to start on your own picture while I'm drawing and speaking. Why do I use white paper? This is ideal when I'm working with students who have some self-aware experience with layering transparent colours. We use a lot of high quality tempera watercolour paint in our classes and we also have access to a variety of brands of colour marker pens and brush marker pens that create vibrant transparent colour. Therefore, using white paper allows us to increase the luminosity of our lighter hues because the white paper shows through. On white paper, the VLT method is great for further developing students' skills in creating edge-to-edge -edge compositions either with marker pens, as I am demonstrating here, or with watercolours by building up their pale layers over the whole composition first and then layering in the darker and darker hues. You'll see some student examples of this after the demo. We use a lot of mixed media too, so students will also draw on top of their tempera painting when it is dried using marker pens or colour pencils or pastels. Or they might introduce collage elements as I am doing in this demonstration. Regarding media choices, it is quite typical in my classroom for students to choose the art materials they would like to use. And if they are in any doubt, whether their choice will enable them to demonstrate the day's learning goals, they are in a habit of checking in with me. You will have noticed that my choice-based approach in the classroom encompasses all decisions aside from the mandatory learning goals and tasks. Student choice in this VLT method lesson encompasses subject choices, stylistic choices, art media, and paper stock. I have observed that one of the long-term benefits of this choice-based approach is that students tend to transfer their learning across units of work more readily. So I will see, and you will see some student examples too, that some students use the VLT method in later projects without any direct prompting from me. This is an artistic behaviour that is also overtly encouraged. Whenever I am introducing a new method or a new set of art ideas, 
I tell the students that they can demonstrate their openness to new experiences by trying something. When they try it and apply it, this demonstrates they are open to learning from it. I explain that the art program expects them to try new things, and then after that they can decide whether they want to continue using it in their own work. Choosing whether to own and retain the new methods or ideas always comes after first trying them. Now let's see what my students did with their first experiences and subsequent uses of the VLT method. I said at the beginning that I was going to talk a little bit about my teaching philosophy and particularly around the issue of creating open-ended situations for students. The VLT method is a really good example of how to structure this. So the demonstration and the examples that we've looked at in art history, in filmmaking, in animation, in children's illustrations show that even though there is a a method with three elements in it, the creative diversity that is possible is huge. So this combination of showing a method and demonstrating it, but also showing sufficient examples to students that they can see that there's a range of creative responses to this idea, opens possibilities for them. Now I amplify that even more in my instructions. 
And we often talk about these elements here are quite specifically tied to the learning goals and I want you to try them. But everything else is your free choice. So with the VLT method, we were saying try the three elements, the vignette, the luminous background or a luminosity somewhere in the middle of the picture, and the scale difference between the tall surroundings and the smaller figures or the characters, whoever it is they want in their picture. We talk also about thinking about the mood, the atmosphere, the emotional expression that they want to invest their picture with. Those are the starting points. The process starting points are sketches. Because you're trying a new method for the first time, try it very quickly on some sketch paper. And I said to the students, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Be very, very quick and think about what's, my, what's the color of the emotion I'm thinking about? What's the color of the vignette? What's the color of the mood that I want to invest my picture with? Very quickly sketch some ideas until Things start working in your imagination and you see the picture that you want to create. And then it's over to you. You may choose the materials you want to use. You may choose the size and the format. You may choose the style you want to work in and you choose the subject. So the picture expresses something that is true to you, something that you are feeling, something that you're excited by, and also something that you already are familiar with and feel good at. Now in that way, structuring the mandatory elements, which are usually couched in this term of try it, it's a challenge, let's see what happens, an experiment, along with very clearly amplifying the free choice elements, creates a marvelous opportunity for students to express themselves it also creates a challenge because they have to make decisions. So there are learning opportunities in how they work out what they're going to do. So what about assessment in this context? And I want to talk about formative assessment as well as summative assessment, the giving of grades. Because in the school I am, I do have to give grades during the semester. The first thing I should say though is that I'm creating an assessment environment where the students feel there is no jeopardy. They can experiment, they can make mistakes, they can start all over again, they can get to an end of a project and happily be dissatisfied because they will be able to understand what they've learned through that process. So no jeopardy. Which also means that I am not making grades for individual pieces of work. The summative assessments that I'm doing are made on the basis of student progress over several months. In fact, I only have to give three grades per semester. But the formative assessment is regular and ongoing. And here we use the same language and the same three criteria in our learning goals, in the one-on-one -on -one conversations in the classroom, and in the final summative assessments as well. The first criteria is, am I expressing myself? Is it my creativity in this work? The second element is, am I open to having new experiences and learning new ideas? And the third element is, do I try to improve the skills I already have and grow new skills through the work that I'm doing in the art room. These three things, creativity, openness to new experiences, and skills improvement come together beautifully in every project. There are balances between the three, but they come together as a whole of student development over the course of a semester and then over the course of the year. What did I learn from my students and how do I learn from my students? Maybe I should answer that second question first. 
This year I had the luxury of teaching a fourth grade art club every week for one hour and I have only 10 students in the club and they're very passionate about art and I also teach them in fourth grade art along with their classmates. So in the club every week I have the opportunity to experiment with new lessons that I'm developing. Some weeks I've developed a project specifically for the art club and other weeks I'm introducing something that I tell them look I want to try this with you because I'm not quite sure how this is going to work and I'm really looking for your feedback and this has been a treasure trove for me and in the case of the VLT method this was very specifically useful. I learned something very important with them that made me restructure my approach. And the thing that I learned was around materials. The initial idea for the VLT method was to present the ideas as I have to you today. But instead of doing a drawing and painting based creative project, to do something using cut uh, craft paper, coloured craft paper and layering the paper a little bit like creating um, stage scenery so that I, we had cut out vignettes and layers of cut out vignettes that progressively went into the background. So I was thinking about how the VLT method creates an illusion of depth and space through the relationship between the vignette and the illuminated background and I thought that this might become more apparent and more tangible for the students if we actually worked in paper relief. Well, I understood this perfectly well, but what I discovered was that the range of skills in scissors handling, in cutting paper, in uh, being able to glue uh, spaces in, and just the mechanics of doing the paper craft created huge problems for some students and very few problems for others, but what they all shared was a frustration with how laborious the process was. I went away and thought about this and decided that while I need to develop a different kind of project to develop those skills, those paper craft skills that they need, but I should look at a different art media approach to the VLT method. So I learned a very, very important lesson because I think that if I had gone into a whole fourth grade class with that first idea, there would have been more frustration than pleasure in the student experience. At a macro level, I've reached the stage where most of my teaching year, I'm presenting new material. This arose partly in response to my experience of teaching online for nearly two years under the COVID pandemic, where I was developing almost completely new material so that students could adapt to the very diverse situations that they had at home. We were having to improvise with materials. And one of the things that came out of that was a much stronger emphasis on diverse ways of dealing with a single topic, a much stronger emphasis on students having free choice about 80% of the project and me being therefore much more refined, I suppose, and more minimalist in the way I identified the mandatory elements of the project and the learning goals. So we developed a culture of adaptation, experimentation and improvisation. There are all sorts of things that the students could do at home that we had not previously done in the classroom. One of these was the use of online games or video games. So many students produced very, very interesting art projects within the Minecraft environment. A lot of students, because they had more access to tablets and computers, were teaching themselves digital painting and drawing. And I didn't want to lose any of that when we came back to in-person teaching. But it means on a day-to-day -day basis, what I'm discovering is the diversity of improvisation, the diversity of imagination, and the diversity of creativity has blossomed this year. And what I'm learning, therefore, is that the more flexible I am 
as a teacher in creating a choice-based environment, not just situations on a micro scale, but a whole culture of choice. And the more precise and minimalist I am in defining learning goals, then we see amazing results amongst the children. How does what I've learned from students during these tectonic shifts in our teaching landscape relates to the VLT method. What I've tried to outline in today's presentation is the importance of creating a very clear demonstration of a method so that students can use it in their own way. And this is the reason that all of my demonstrations have been fast, so almost casual, and unfinished so that the students see that their role is to take those beginnings and to infuse them with their own sensibility and then to make their own image. To further reflect on this question of what I learned from students after the VLT lesson, I want to rewind to Agatha's beautiful drawing, which I showed at the end of the student examples, her drawing of mushrooms and a pond and an open space in the middle. Here it is here. Agatha did not do this as part of the VLT method project. She did this sometime later. We did a project looking at the Chinese Lunar New Year water tiger. And I got to, came to me at the end of the class with this drawing. I said to her, wow, tell me about this. And she told me the story, which she then, after we spoke, she wrote on the top of the picture. And the story was of a water tiger who had done something bad during their life. And so they had been punished by being trapped in the reflection in the pond. And when I looked at the work, I saw immediately the structure of the VLT method with its tall forms and its contrastingly small or tiny characters. And I saw these tall forms arching over a light space. But what was interesting as well, it was not just the physical structure that she had produced, but the air of mystery. And this is a perfect example of what we hope for, I suppose, that the things that students are learning in individual projects will be transferable knowledge, that they will be adopted by the student as something that is useful, something that they can keep in their art quiver and pull out and apply in other contexts where it seems useful. Thank you for joining me for this session on the VLT method for Enchanted Scenes. I hope there is some inspiring takeaways for you, whether it's the method itself, whether it's the focus on choice-based programs or the assessment insights that I shared. Thank you again.